Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, happy Canada Day. Um, actually, coming from Vancouver, uh, Canada, which is on the the west coast of Canada, so it is it is a little early for me. But it was uh, Canada Day yesterday, so just want to wish all of you a happy Happy Canada Day. There. Uh, title of my presentation uh, is Development and Application of Economic Learning Health Systems Forecasting and Simulation Based Analysis of Home Health for Seniors. Um, so if you haven't heard enough about Markov models in R today, uh, don't worry, because we we got more coming. Um, what I'd love to do is give you a little bit of background on uh, expenditure in the Canadian health system and uh, our seniors population before jumping into, in, into the work. Uh, but I'll try to get through it in about 10 to 15 minutes, because I'd love to have some time for questions, and I actually have a few discussion questions that I've thrown up uh, as well at the end of the presentation. So just in terms of background, in 2018, in Canada, we were spending about $250 billion Canadian, uh, not, not not pounds, um, but that number has now increased to over $300 billion in 2021 and $344 billion now, I believe. So that's around $8,000, to $10,000 per person. And uh, it's almost double that for, for seniors here in Canada, so around sixteen dollars to $20,000. In Canada, like many other countries, I think now, uh, the proportion of seniors is rapidly increasing. I think it was around 2016 here that the number of Canadians over the age of 65 outnumbered those under the age of 15. So that presented a lot of challenges uh, for the health authority that uh, I was working with in the PhD. They expressed challenges around evaluation of their home health services, a lot of variation in the services that they were providing. This burning platform in terms of the demographics and the increased pressures that they were facing, and then also some questions around cost effectiveness as well that they wanted to address. So this was, like I said, the genesis of the PhD. And what I did is develop something called the Economic Learning Health System. And my task there was to kind of combine all of these health economic methods with learning health systems to try and uh, address some of these challenges for this, uh, for, for this group within the health authority. So how do we combine econometric forecasting, HTA and economic evaluation with these learning health uh, system frameworks? So what I'll do in this slide is just tell you a little bit about the framework, and then in the next few slides, I'll get into how we actually operationalized it. So the first step here is forecasting. Uh, what we ended up doing was autoregressive integrated moving average forecasting, but essentially the goal there is to basically say, well, if we continue business as usual, where are we going to be in 10 years from now? Um, you don't really need to use such a sophisticated method uh, with patient populations increasing so dramatically, it's not going to be great. And so then the, the second step here is thinking about how we can address that. And so this is looking at new innovative models of care or interventions or technologies that we could potentially use to, to address that forecast. And the third step is where we have the modeling and, and uh, we, we ended up using Markov modeling as well. Um, the Markov model reflects the current baseline in care, and then the interventions are that we've thought of in the second step are simulated, and we end up choosing the ones that we like the most and deploy them with an economic evaluation, invest and scale to the rest of the organization, and then adjust as necessary. And then the whole idea with these learning health systems is to kind of rinse and repeat this to have continuous improvement and trans ultimately transformation of the health system. So the supports, uh, you can't do this without data, can't do this without finance engagement. It's helpful to have scientific partnership. And it's also nice to have a culture of vulnerability too, just because there's a lot of uh, ideas here and interventions which may actually not end up getting implemented um, if you're simulating them and the results are not as uh, promising as, as others. So for the forecasting step, like I said, uh, we did REMA. Uh, this is basically forecasting the costs of each uh, patient that has received home health services and was over the age of 65 within the health authority. The black line represents their actual cost. The red line is the REMA model. And then the blue line is the forecasted cost with the gray uh, to reflect the uncertainty. So take home message here is about a 20% increase. So then the next question is, what are we going to do about it? Uh, so a couple of the solutions that uh, that we came up with were personalized support and stabilization teams. So the idea here is to get patients out of the hospital and back home sooner and then to keep them out of the hospital. So that was using a uh, group of home health services to be able to do that. 
The other intervention was paramedic palliative care. Uh, and basically, instead of calling 911 and having paramedics uh, come and basically take the patient directly to the emergency department, uh, they would actually be able to provide care in the homes of those patients. So we got into the Markov modeling. I, I, I just want to highlight um, a little bit of a difference in the approach that we took to, to Markov modeling. So from what I've seen mainly, Mark, our Markov models are based on disease states of patients and the costs of the acute care are reflected in those states or uh, with events and, and, and event rates associated with each one of those states. Unfortunately, that approach wouldn't really work for our purposes in, in this economic learning health system deployment, just because there were so many patients with so many different diseases and comorbidities. And so we had to kind of flip that on its head a bit because we needed a model that was agnostic to the disease uh, and that was able to simulate uh, those different interventions and ultimately any different intervention that the health authority was thinking about uh, for this patient population. So what I did instead, and um, I've, I've, I've actually found now a couple of other folks who have used this same approach, but um, at the time I thought, I thought this was a brilliant idea, um, but like so many of my brilliant ideas, you know, usually somebody else has already, has already done it. Um, so instead, we had patients at home, at home with home health service in the emergency department in acute care, long-term care, and death. And using the administrative data sets from the health authority, we were actually able to populate all these different transition probabilities and costs associated with each one of the states too. And then what we did is just imputed the utilities. So once we had that, we were able to simulate these different interventions, Really promising results here. I just have the cost effectiveness plane and the and the net monetary benefit. Very positive uh, cloud a cloud of Visor points uh, concentrated in the southeast quadrant, which is what you like to see. Same thing for the paramedic palliative care, um, but with a slightly less monetary benefit. So the the home health managers found this useful, um, but they also said, well, there's a couple of other criteria we might want to include here. So what we ended up doing was a bit of an additional multi-criterion decision analysis on top of these simulations. And the two criteria that we that they encouraged us to consider was evidence and feasibility. So because these were simulations, um, the we were limited in terms of the evidence that we had uh, because they were these were relatively new ideas for the for the home health area. The evidence was stronger for paramedic palliative care just because we got it from a deployment in another province. Um, but the feasibility was actually higher for the PSS teams because the suite of services that would be offered in these teams were controlled by the health authority, whereas paramedics were actually uh, controlled by a different organization altogether. So to try to change, get them to change their practice to provide palliative care would have been much harder. So these uh, these MCDA criteria were, were included in, uh, in the decision making in addition to the ICERs. So that's what I was able to do. So just in terms of future study, that's what I was able to do in the get down the PhD. I'm fortunate to have received a fellowship from the Canadian government to now not only close the loop here on on the economic learning health system, but also scale this work up to a provincial level as well. So before we were doing this at a health authority level, which is just one region within the province, and now we're doing this at a, at a provincial level, which is really exciting. So just in terms of discussion, I see a lot of overlaps here with uh, Dr. Robert Smith's work in Living HDA and this idea of having these models be continuously updated with new data. And I think it'd be really interesting to talk more about uh, how we could do this with, with econo economic learning health systems. So just a couple of questions that I have for discussion. If folks want to um, ask me questions or ask questions about the work or just kind of sound off on these on these discussion questions, happy to have the ones. But you know, we have living HDA. What about living models and analytic infrastructure for health systems? Should we be building one-off models for every reimbursement decision, or should we potentially be thinking of uh, you know building this analytic infrastructure that could help us answer multiple questions about a given uh, patient population? How much resource should we be allocating towards these real world evaluations? Um, so, uh, you know, one of the steps there is after we do the simulation to actually validate that with the real world deployment. 
Um, but that's at least in in uh, in my area something that I see uh, health authorities not really in, uh, investing in as much. Then should HTA methods be applied to these non-tech uh, reimbursements for resource allocation decisions? Uh, I think we do a great job of applying HTA to pharmaceuticals and and other and, and some other technologies. But you know, should, should uh, are the, are these methods appropriate for? Um, these different innovative models of care that are those kinds of things at a health authority and a provincial level. So, okay. Yeah. Perfect. 10 minutes. Thank I see you very something much. in the chat. Yeah. What's that? Oh, well, if you can read it, you're welcome to. It's actually read. about Jack's COPD model. Yeah. So. Oh, I mean, it's relevant for yours actually as well. So Anna oh, Duncan sure. has asked, I can imagine the observational data could use some adjusting for compounding. Another thing but done better in R. So it's kind of also relevant for yours when you're talking about bringing in um, data from health systems, because obviously there's data generating mechanisms there that, you know, aren't a trial. Um, so perhaps you could maybe comment a bit on that. And then there's also a question about MCDA that you can get to after. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great questions. So yeah, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of uncertainty here. I mean, for the, for the PSS teams, this is basically just clinical opinion from the folks that we were working with. And so not even observational data to be able to, to, to back that up. But that, I mean, that, that, that was the intention, right? We were at that stage of, you know, thinking about all the different things that we could do. Uh, and so often uh, somebody's, you know, best guess was, was, was all we had to rely on for the, for that particular intervention. Um, for the paramedic palliative care, we did have, I don't know if you call it a trial, um, but certainly some observational data to be able to inform this. So I guess the question there is, you know, should we wait for an RCT, uh, you know, a phase three uh, RCT before we do any modeling? In this particular kind of deployment, uh, we we thought, no, you know, we, we're at that stage, we're thinking of new interventions. Um, these are our best guesses and, uh, you know, we simulate it. And then using that information, we decide what we want to actually deploy and then confirm those simulations with with that deployment. So that's that's the approach that we took. Um, challenges around communicating uh, that uncertainty with uh, with with our stakeholders, and so that's why we decided to incorporate uh, you know that idea of strength of evidence uh, a little bit more explicitly for them in, in the MCD approach. And no, unfortunately, the MCDA approach wasn't really done in R. Um, so, yeah, sorry about that, Jack. We did we did build a shiny model off of this too. Um, unfortunately, I, I I just looked to go pull it up, and our domain has ex expired. So um, hopefully, hopefully next time I'll be able to share that more. But we're also thinking about, and and perhaps there's been other presentations about this uh, in the past couple of days too. But how to incorporate generative AI in this? So you know, thinking, um, thinking about a use case where, you know, a nurse has an idea for something that can improve the the home health services that they're that they're delivering, they could go to that shiny interface, um, simulate the intervention using drag and drops for how to change the transition probabilities um, for the for, for the patients to those acute services, um, and then potentially generate a report that then she could submit, she or he could submit to to, to their uh, manager. So that's that's something else we're we're uh, well thinking about and actively building right now too. I guess that's very uh, relevant for the next session after the break, which will be a bit more on on AI yeah. in terms of that kind of living system. Like how so you mentioned, like a drag and drop. Like how much involvement did you have in terms of because you mainly seem to present the stuff that you you've done in your PhD. How in terms of of assessing whether these things are are working and and if sort of validating or feeding back into the models. How is there a plan or how much involvement have you had with that? Yeah, absolutely. So I th I mean I think there's two questions there. I think there's validation of the model itself, and then there's validation of the interventions that you're simulating. So that's kind of how I break up those those two two separate things. Um, we're, we're really fortunate actually with the administrative data sets we have, we basically have virtually every single British Columbian in, in the provincial data set. So that makes it a pretty robust, uh, data set. So we're, we're, we know 
what has happened, what their trajectory has been. So we know where they are in terms of those different states. There's no, there's no real uncertainty around that. Um, and the way that we validate that is basically we run the model uh, over, over the time horizon, which has been about a year, um, just because the model cycles are one day. And then after a year, we compare that back to what actually happened to those patients. And that's, that's how we validate the model itself. The simulations are a bit of a different story, um, just because we are sometimes relying on not great evidence to, to, to input into the model. Um, so, oh, I see something else popped up in the chat. Uh, so, so the only way to really validate that is to then do a deployment. And so that's what we're doing right now. We're looking at something called long-term care uh, at home. And right now we're simulating it, but with the intention of actually doing a deployment uh, to then uh, kind of have that feedback loop with, with the modeling. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so Nicola's putting in uh, some links there. So she's previously looked at um, a grant proposal for doing MCDA and R. I'm definitely not going to be able to read all of that now, but um, sort of pairwise combinations of valuation criteria and different ways of scoring and weighting the preferences. So I'm sure that'll be interesting for you for the future. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if anyone else has a question that they can either put in the chat or it's possibly slightly too many people for me to reliably be able to see hands, to be fair. <laughs> Maybe you tell us a bit more. Do you, you mention having Shiny and kind of how that was received in terms of being able to kind of bring your message across and, and how you whether you thought it was helpful. I mean, one of the things that I maybe struggle with with Shiny a little bit is that I'm more as a person who wants to see uh, what's behind it. So how that kind of played with your different users, whether there were people that really wanted to get into the guts of your model or whether it was kind of more users with a different focus. Yeah, it was, um, I think, you know, I, th I think that brings up something interesting around the uh, guts. I'll, I'll, I'll change your question slightly later. So there's a lot of concerns around privacy of data. So I think um, I think this is a topic that a, a lot of us are struggling with, but the data used to inform the models, um, you know, was in very secure environments. And okay, I see another question. I was going to ask Shiny question. More experience building that for yourself. Yeah. Um, so that was a challenge, uh, and and that's something that we're looking at right now. That I, I will say that the shiny app that I built was more of a demo to kind of demonstrate the ability in the PhD. Now in the postdoc, we're thinking about how to actually um, have it rely on 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 the real data. So what that that is something we're working through is how to do that in a way that maintains patient privacy and data security. Um, the arguments that I've been making is that this is at an aggregate level. Um, we also were thinking about making it in a way where folks could put in their own data. So es essentially populate it with their own transition probability matrix. That makes it more challenging because then, you know, we, we you'd have to be a little bit more of a sophisticated user to be able to do it. So that's some of the some of the tension and the trade offs that we have there. Um, so I think it really uh, the, the the fundamental question is who's going to be using this 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 shiny app? Is it going to be the nurse on the front line who wants to create a business case for this new idea that they have to be able to improve the home health services? Is it going to be an analyst in one of the the health authorities? Um, is it going to be the, our deputy ministers who are thinking about doing their an analysis. And I think developing, and it, and it may have to be all of them. And so it may have to be different solutions there and different uh, challenges that we have to work through for, the, for those different pieces. So, and so Robert was asking, I was gonna ask the shiny question and more um, on your experience building the app itself. Yeah, so so I actually I actually did it a long, a long time ago. Um, and I had quite a bit of help from couple of other folks it was good uh we uh you know um i think there's a lot more resources now to, to, to be able to help and certainly dr smith's course uh with dark peak dark peak analytics uh would be a fantastic resource for folks who are thinking about building uh their own shiny apps i think i'm also interested in 
how we could make the websites themselves a little bit more uh, dynamic as well in terms of the questions that we're asking and then have those fit into the in, into the Markov modeling. And then how we can output it using generative AI and that type of stuff too. So maybe that's another little teaser for the, for this afternoon as well.